Welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Well, I think I would like to ask our audience how do they feel having you here, instead of asking you how do you feel being <laughs> here, but how do you feel about being here? Oh, I'm excited to, to be here. I, I really am. I haven't been here in a while, so it's, uh, it's great to be here. So when you go to your window in your hotel, what do you see across the street? I see the Parthenon. Yeah. yeah and I do. what kind of thoughts come to your mind when you see the Parthenon? Um, let's see. Well, uh, it seems quite small from my window. So <laughs> I was like, wow, I thought it was a lot bigger. I, I, I'd never really know. Uh, sizes in, in a city. This is why I love to walk around, because suddenly things loom up and you're right next to, to a building that you, you have dreamed about, and it's suddenly right there. But this is very far away. It's really quite tiny, and really just a little diamond on the top of the hill. So well, I think this is one of the big differences between uh, Greece and the US, but especially Athens, where everything has some kind of a human scale, even the churches are not like cathedrals, and the Parthenon is not a pyramid. Uh, but how small, how big do you feel in the United States these days? How big is it? Well, we have pencil buildings now, and they are really frightening. They're just the si size and shape of pencils, and we have like maybe four when you see the skyline. You see the, the regular, you know, this and that, the skyscrapers, and then you see these pencils. <laughs> they are so dangerous to live in. I think they're very top-heavy, so they don't, you know... But uh, as a citizen, over. do you feel small or big in the United States these days? Mm. Well, I, I feel... Uh, I, I'm not sure it's about size. Um, I f I, it's more about disappointment <laughs> than size. Uh, I think uh, it, it's like shattering, a shattering the last few weeks. So uh, I, I haven't decided whether that's a big or a small thing, but uh, I do, uh, I uh, grew up as a kid uh, in a movement uh, that was, you know, we were going to stop the war and we, we felt a lot of power, you know. Um, we uh, also had a Counterculture, so which is not existing now, which makes a big difference. If you have a, uh, your own music, your own clothes, your own books, your own everything, your own philosophy, uh, your own vibe, and now kids are don't have that as much. Like, like they don't have their own culture. They kind of have to fit into the dominant one, which is branding and marketing and finding your, your place and trying to just define very kind of rigidly sometimes who they are. Um, I was part of a group of people. We just, we didn't have a plan. We were just going to dance down the road and whatever happened, you know. And then um, there were people who had plans, like I'm going to live in this house, I'm going to do this job, I'm going to have this. And we felt sorry for them, you know. It was like, but you've said in the past that you are, you feel as a part of uh, American humor as well. Do you think that uh, these days in America, humor can be a weapon or a shield in order to protect yourself from what's happening? Well, I, I think many things can be shields uh, right now. Um, prejudice can be a shield, humor can be a shield. Um, it, it's not so funny right now in the United States, uh, but um, but of course it's always funny. There's always something really so absurd about this sort of crazy posturing uh, that's going on. So, uh, but um, so I, I think some American comedians are having a pretty good time. <laughs> Is it the cynical ones who are having a good time? Are the cynics having a good time these days? Because if you're cynical, then you can be both safe or free, it depends on the yeah, way you I, say I don't it. think cynics have a good time. Cynics never have a good time. Not really, no. They're not a, they're not a happy bunch. You know, it's, it's hard to be cynical. You have to really just be dark and, and uh, yeah. So they're, they're, they're not a jolly bunch, the cynics. But didn't you invent cynics? Cynicism is a... a well, 
Cynics, if you ask me, I think they have a dry sense of humor, yeah. but they can never be your friends. Oh, you don't have any cynical friends? <laughs> no, my friends are all romantics. Ro you have only romantic friends? Yes. Wow, yes. They, you need they, to they, find they a couple still of fight cynics. for the utopia. There's you, one? They still fight for a utopia that they know will never exist. Oh, that's so... so. Are you a romantic? <laughs> Am I a romantic? Yes. Are you? Uh, well, like most people, I'm a mixture of a lot of different things, depending on the day, depending on the topic, you know? So it could be... Um, uh, uh, yeah, so, like, yeah, like most people, real mix. But what do you do in order to be able to feel sad without being sad? <laughs> Okay, so this is a, my teacher, Mingyu Rinpoche, uh, is, uh, well, he is the happiest person in the world, officially. If you, in case you're wondering if there was one, he is, according to the neuroscience department in Wisconsin, uh, they, m they measure happiness by putting, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, things on your, on your, around your brain and measuring your response. So. Uh, and they do it really with sound, so they play sound that's, for most people, be, be su incredibly disturbing, and and you would just be speechless. It's really difficult to hear this, and um, because he's a he's a Tibetan lama and meditator, he has what we call equilibrium. So, so they're measuring. I mean, some people would say, well, they're measuring his hard-heartedness. You know, if they if he's able to just resist going, ah, I, you know, he resists and, um, but his, uh, he, he's a very wonderful teacher and the, the thing that rings the most for me is something that he said, which you just quoted, which is, um, he says, try to practice how to feel sad without actually being sad, which I think is a, a wonderful distinction to make because um, there are so many sad things in the world. And if you pretend that they're not there, you're an idiot, you know. And uh, on the other hand, so the most important thing in this is not to be sad yourself. So don't become what you're looking at, but absolutely really feel it and, and don't, don't push it away, uh, but do not become that. Well, since you like words, and we were talking about words before our official discussion here, idiot comes from a Greek word, which means idiotis. Idiotis is the owner. Well, the owner is the person who only cares about his own private space. Okay. So idiot, as a silly person, is the person who only cares about his own private well, space. Well, I know so many idiots who don't care about their own space. It's really strange. Well, their selves, themselves is their space. So that, that's more than enough. Mm, yeah. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I love the fact that you talk about beauty as something even more important than truth, maybe. So... Well, that was a kind of... Tr that's a trap. It's, it's a, a trap. trick question, you know, if you're supposed to choose between those two. Uh, it, it's like when somebody says, you know, if you could have no eyes or no ears, mm. you know, which would it be? And I'm like, oh, it's, like, <laughs> it's a, um, really impossible to answer that question, uh, or it's just gloomy, you know, so... But if I... It really had to answer the truth and beauty thing. I, I, I don't. I, I would say beauty for sure. Mm. I, I absolutely would because um, it's. Uh, and also, the m the more you see these um, sort of uh, eternal truths uh, kind of play themselves out, you see them. I, I begin to see them more as beliefs than as some absolute thing. So I just see people believing things, and but but we're living in a at least in the United States in a a, a world of of stories, you know. Mm -hmm. So that you uh, the people in power are the ones really with the best story, and that's that's often the case. But it's really vivid now. It's so it's so clear that um, uh, that it's uh, presented as as um, uh, 
uh, truth slash uh, story. But as um, you're asking many times, I guess yourself, who is telling the story these days in the world? Who is the storyteller? And what are we in this story that unfolds? I would say who's asking. <laughs> I am. Okay. <laughs> it's a personal subjective <laughs> question. Okay. A very uh, personal question. Okay. Well, um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm, I'm very interested in... I, I don't use uh, uh, the word I so often. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, try to um, uh, look at other ways to tell stories. And sometimes third person is really handy. Um, and, and I'm also not the kind of artist who's interested in, you know, like self-expression. Mm. You know, like, I, I don't want people, I don't care if you know me, you know. I really don't care. It's not the point. I, mean, the, the, I guess the point would be um, just to see something and maybe it's kind of even familiar because I, the, the most... Uh, um, the thing that I like the best, if somebody just talk, says, oh, I, I really liked what you did. It was just like what I was thinking already, just a little bit different. It's, so it's that familiarity of, of like, um, you just turn it like 10 degrees and it looks very different, but it looks, it's also familiar. I mean, I'm not into making new forms that are just like, wow, that's a new form or a new plaid. That's such a wild plaid. You know, that kind of new isn't so interesting to me as just kind of old new. So do you see yourself as a messenger of a collective thought or a collective experience? No, no. I, I, I do like angels a lot. And um, I just... Uh, I just... A friend of mine was telling me about a new angel that I didn't know, like Kairos. Wasn't Kairos an angel, kind of? Kairos. Icaros. Yeah. Icaros who got the wings on his back in no, order to fly over No, the not sea. that one. No, the one who chooses the right exact moment. Oh, Keros. Keros. Yes, <laughs> Keros, yes Keros. it's the time. Time and the weather. Time Keros and the weather, time. yeah. Um, and... Uh, I, I just got that little book that was published called The Weather, mm. that the Onassis Foundation did. Yes. And, it was, and I saw that um, yes. as a chapter title, and I, I realized that that's my favorite angel of like yes. the, uh, the exact right second to do something. And that I didn't know that there was no word um, for weather. How can that be? I mean, when, in English, we we like, we use the, we talk about the weather when there's nothing to say, you know. When we just how's the weather? Oh, fine. It's, when it's just a nothing topic, but it's a, it is a, a real thing because we always use it as political weather or you know what's the you know what's the feel of of things. But there's no word really for you're, weather. You're absolutely right, and I I have to say that I really appreciate the fact that you paid attention to the books. Uh, because it's interesting that in Greek uh, we have a word that combines the idea of weather, time, timing, and the right moment. Mm -hmm. So when we say it was about time, you can always translate it as it was about whether to do this or not. But uh, you work with time. I mean, you, you, what you do, music is like the art of time, and you do things that uh, somehow measure this sense of change, when somebody gets in touch with your work, then he becomes another person. And what has happened in between is actually time. And there are people who keep on saying that you have always been ahead of your time. What does ahead of your time mean? Well, uh, I don't exactly know why people would say that. You know, I'm working in the world's most ancient art form, which is stories, and and those are always. Mm, uh, I don't know if stories in in Greek start about once upon a time, but they do in English, and it, they're 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 just like they, they're um, invoking another time, and so I I, I don't um, and 
maybe what makes it look like ahead of its time in some way was this uh, the false veneer of technology. And we were talking about that a little bit before, like I used to be called like a tech artist. And then before that I was called a word artist. And then they, these just horrible um, uh, ways that you call new art forms, like, um, let's see, what was it? it um, uh, there was persona art, there was, I mean, performance art is also very Forma. clumsy. That was it, another thing. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I mean, why aren't books word art, you know? That's like, they're really clumsy sort of titles. But anyway, so I was tech, uh, a high-tech artist, which just meant nothing. I mean, everybody is a tech artist. We all just use stuff like that. So I don't know why, uh, uh, but but it is um, something that I, uh, as a musician, is always an element in uh, what I'm doing. Well, in order to be able to tell a story the way you do it, um, it takes some talents. And uh, Voltnoy, a great colleague of ours, and friends, uh, he called you an amazing observer. So what do you observe when, can you just sit there without observing things? Can you just not think? Can you just be without doing anything, without paying attention to what's going on around you? I do try to do, to do that. And, and that's why I'm a student of um, not only Mingyur Rinpoche, but also, um, uh, the, what I've been studying since like the 70s, I guess, is, is something called um, nature of mind. And so that is about um, trying to resist uh, thoughts. And um, uh, I'm not very successful at that, I have to say, because they're, they're, they're always uh, trying to get your attention, you know, floating by. They're like, they have these like, um, little routines that they do. I am so important, you really have to pay attention to me, or uh, I'm the last of my kind. <laughs> you better look over my way. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I'm always like, whoa, what, what is that? So I, I, I'm, I, have, I guess, a short attention span in certain ways, so this is why I try to study things like that. Why is attention so important? Why, because, you know, I, I was wondering, how do you feel about people who are considered lazy? Do you see lazy? something wrong? Lazy? Uh, yes. There are people, you know, when people t uh, call somebody a lazy person, they consider that a very bad thing. Where I grew up in my family, being lazy was like a sin. How do you feel about people who are just lazy, who don't want to do things? Who don't want to do them? Well. I don't have a, like a, a, a blanket feeling about lazy people because some lazy people are having the best time of, of their lives. I mean, you know, it's, it, I, I don't, um, I am a Puritan, it's true. And like um, when I went to school uh, as a kid, um, my mother would lean down at the last minute and she would, she would yell, win. And I was like, win? Win what? I mean, I, was, I, was, I mean, there was always some kind of thing that you could try to do well or something, but it made life seem like a contest, and that you could you could also then lose. So it was like was, I was terrified. <laughs> I was like, what? Is, um, but um, I think uh, uh, as a workaholic myself, um, I think I. I think I do it just because it's interesting, but maybe not. I'm, I'm not going to delve too deeply into that topic. But, um, you know, but you're, you're a workaholic yourself. I am. Uh -huh. but and I and think, why? Um, why am I a workaholic? Because I like it. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's as simple as that. It's fun. Uh -huh. Yes, I think it's that simple. But another thing that I really wanted to ask you about, because you, you create like these dreamy worlds, and, I, and when it comes to you, I always think of words like death, dreams, life. <laughs> death. Well, it's the beginning of, oh. I mean, if you want to talk about life, you have to talk about death. 
Yeah. And in, uh, talking about Greek language and Greek legends and myths and stuff, sleep is the brother of death. Sleep? Sleep, yes. So uh, it's the closest you can get. So when you're going to your Tibetan book of the dead, um, sleep and death are very close to each other when it comes to ancient Greeks. So how do you feel about sleep? Because especially workaholics, not myself, think of sleep as something that it's like wasting your time. But now what we are finding out is that sleep is another life. And if you don't live that life, you actually live half of your life. What is your relationship to sleep? I like it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, almost a third of my life, like a lot of people, is, is in that state. And, I, and I, I suppose I can't separate it really from dreams. So, so I love the language of of dreams, the jump cuts that you can make, the things that you can learn about yourself in your logical waking life, that you're not making those associations. And, and I do find uh, that uh, there, it, it's a really wonderful way to, to, that your mind can uh, work. And, I th and it is working, it's really kind of good. This red is next to this blue, and let's look at how, how these relate, and, and you, um, and when you don't have all the rules and logic that you apply when you're awake, uh, I find it's, um, uh, it, it can be uh, uh, one of the most creative parts of the day it, to, to uh, uh, dream. When somebody goes to your exhibition now, is it like entering a dream? Oh, well, uh, Yes, in some ways. Um, there's, I, I brought a lot of pictures here, <laughs> which are, I'm going to show you one. Yes. That, because it reminds me of what you're just saying. There was a, um, a room, this is from a show called The Weather, which <laughs> would be called, would be untranslatable. Um, uh, and uh, there's one, oh no, that's coming into this room. This room was a kind of, um, there was going to be a lot of VR in this show. It's, it's a show, it, it, an exhibition at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. And we were going to have a lot of um, VR things. But because of COVID, uh, we, uh, they said, oh, we can't do the masks. And, and, and so I was like, oh, what am I? So I decided, well, maybe if I can like draw VR instead of do all of the electronics. So that was, um, let's see, what is this with the devil? Oh yeah, so this, this is a room, it's like a notebook that you walk into this notebook uh, and it's full of um, uh, uh, just sketches on the wall. Uh, this was just gonna be a corner and then I just got kind of really carried away with this. And um, uh, so there's, uh, there's a talking parrot in there. He's um, uh, on his stand. I think we have a close up of that. Uh, somewhere, um, no, there, oh yeah, so he's, um, I, I built the, a, an early version of this parrot a, a while ago and, and uh, he had a, um, a sensor in his chest so that he, people, when people came into the room he'd, he'd engage them in chit chat or small talk or like art world talk like, uh, oh, you, you are looking so good. Uh, maybe we should have lunch. Let's have a lunch. And you're like, me? Are you talking to me? And <laughs> or you would just like, you'd go, smoke, smoke, want some smoke. You know, you just try to do these beckoning calls to people. And then they'd engage with him. Like the early, you know, uh, computer programs of Eliza and all of those uh, talking computers that, you know, you uh, thought they were might be talking to you. Anyway, uh, let's see what else there is in that section. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, so a lot of quotes. Then also there were some little stories. Now this, this is a, this is a little, uh, this is a fake hologram, um, because when people go into a museum, uh, so it's only this big, so it's in a, in a corner of a, of a room, and this person telling a story. Um, it's hard to, 
uh, do narrative things in a in a museum. You know, really, really like you. You know, you're you're in a um, biennial and you come to the video room and you're like, yeah, it's just like um, everything else you see in an instant painting or a sculpture, and then you kind of go, oh, I got to spend three hours in this video room with not very good projection and really uncomfortable seats. And so, but but uh, narrative takes time, as you said before. So um, there were different solutions to how you put a story in a museum. Let's see if there is another. Oh yeah, so this is an, a huge um, image of a, of a, uh, a um, Mohammed El Garani, who was was my collaborator in this case, and he was. Um, it was a piece about prison. And Please tell us a bit more about this particular one, because I think it's um, it's an amazing story. Yeah, his story was. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, there, let's see. There was a before that. I was in just as a little background. This this is a an, uh, a work that I did in in uh, uh, let's go to this instead uh, yeah um, I was asked to do a um, uh, a sound installation in a little town called Krems in Austria and um, I went to this place and it was a really big 13th century church very resonant, and I didn't know what to do. I had no ideas. I was just like, and the curator kept coming over and going, what's your project? What's your project? Which, and I was like, I don't know. And just really to escape the curator, I ran up some stairs and uh, in the ch old church, and I went and looked in the, in the middle of this perfect little Austrian town was a maximum security prison. So I was in the bell tower and I was looking over at the guard tower and a guy who was, has a big machine gun and he's looking at me and I was like, whoa. Okay, so I ran down the stairs and I said to the curator, okay, well, I'm gonna do something about telepresence and we're gonna build a studio in the church and we're gonna build a studio in the prison and we're gonna have, have a prisoner. This was in 1998. Um, and the prisoner is gonna sit very still and we're going to build a life-size statue of this person and put him on the, in the apse of the church. And we're gonna beam the image of this person and wrap him onto the statue. So it would be about time, about serving time, about, uh, and it would be about telepresence and also the, the attitude of the church and the prison to the body, tell, you, know, in, uh, you know, incarceration and incarnation, and there, not there. So surprisingly, they said, okay. I was like, really? Okay, and then uh, shortly after that, um, the uh, we learned that Austrian law forbids um, the use of a prisoner's image. You no longer own your image when you're in prison in Austria. A very 21st century thing as well. You know, who owns your image? What can they do with your your picture online? A lot, a lot. Who own, do you own that anymore? So it's about that as well. And uh, eventually. Um, their sort of attorney general said, oh, I love this project. Well, do you have special dispensation to do it? So I said, okay. Uh, eventually we didn't do it, but it, it, we did it at the Prada Museum and here's Santino. Uh, he was uh, a, a prisoner in uh, San, San Vittorio prison in, in Milan. And uh, it was a weird um, project in a way because you know, when you're collaborating with someone it has to really be a, a collaboration, or otherwise it's, it's a very close to just exploitation of someone. So I spent a lot of time going to the prison, spending time with the prisoners and talking to them about this project. And uh, <laughs> this is a, a white collar prison in Milan and it was, it was basically all these guys uh, who were in for life and they, they're genuine bad guys, but they were, um, they were uh, speaking Latin and Greek and they were all writing books and they were very, very clever, very urbane. They were all wearing Armani and I was like, whoa. And uh, they could have their friends over for dinner at the prison. They had knives. They were in forever. But I was trying to explain to this, this project to them and they were like, mm-hmm, uh-huh. And <laughs> because they were lawyers, all of them, they were, they were very, very skilled at 
manipulating you and making you think that that was your idea when it was their idea and they're just kind of just nodding like you're nodding right now, just uh-huh, it's like, hmm, that's a clever idea. Oh. And so they, they had chosen the prisoner I was going to collaborate with, and so I was gradually, gradually talking to Santino, um, bank robber, murderer, murdered some people on his way out of the bank, and a writer. A wonderful writer, and we uh, so he learned to sit very still, and and we did this project in Milan. I then wanted to do it in the United States, and made some uh, years later. This was '98, and so in 2015, uh, the Park Avenue Armory asked me to do that something, and I pres was proposing a very big prisoner because, you know, one on one in every 100 Americans is in prison. We had. It's, and it was a kind of strange coincidence that, you know, the, the second that prisons became privatized and were a business, there were lots more prisoners suddenly. So anyway, I, I proposed doing some things like making a kind of like Egyptian uh, hallway with prisoners streaming in from all the upstate prisons. There are already cameras and reality shows in prison. There are lots of things that happen in prisons already with that. So they were like, uh, and so that was the project that was was getting underway. And yeah, that's just in case you. <laughs> now, uh, at, at some point, not too, uh, pretty pretty far into the project, uh, I got um, heard from Homeland Security, and they said, "You will never be doing this project in the United States of America." So I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I got the message, and um, yeah, artists are so free. should do whatever we want. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, the, um, oh, and by the way, this was supposed to also happen at the Whitney, and then they decided it was just too political. So don't, the at the Whitney, yeah. That's the interesting. Whitney Museum. Yeah, they said, no, we, ch we can't do it, it's too political. I was like, okay. okay. Um, so then they said, what's your plan B? And I was like, you know, I didn't have a plan B, so I came up with this thing, which was a, like a kind of Western um, landscape that had sort of strange things in it. Little, um, there would be little kids playing cowboys with like little stubble miniature, uh, you know, like like beards and um, miniature ponies and things. Oh yeah, there was a motorcade that was going to happen. Another Kennedy thing that actually didn't happen. And there's Jackie Kennedy Onassis in the back seat. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, so it was a kind of history parade with a lot of other things, with lots of miniature ponies. So not the, the, uh, this was not something I was, it was just sketches, you know? And so they were like, okay, you're doing this. And I was like, really? Okay, so now we need the photo shoot. And I said, okay, we'll bring some ponies in. And so we brought some ponies in to, for the photo shoot and, <laughs> you know, playing the violin with ponies and, uh, it it was absurd. Um, so um, you know, when you do with the you PR there, it the doesn't piece. it doesn't look absurd. I mean, with you <laughs> being there, it all makes sense for some reason. I don't know. Ponies, uh, you might know, are just really nasty. Well, they they really kick and and like they're. Because in reality, they wanted to be horses. It's like Donald Trump. He wanted to be <laughs> maybe, president. Maybe so Donald he, Trump you know, is a like pony. Like yeah, I could see that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my sister, who's a horse trainer, said if ponies were people, they'd all be in jail. <laughs> Which, for Don, you know, it's not a bad idea. We're trying, we're trying. We'll see what happens. He's a slithery guy. So anyway, um, but then, then the next thing that happened, so I, it was completely stalled. I was like, I have no project. It's, it's like next week, more or less. And um, so then I got in touch with by, kind of by chance, with some people who um, have a group in London called Reprieve, and they work with um, people on death row in the United States, and they work with um, prisoners in Guantanamo. So uh, I, I got in touch with them and said, you know, um, told them about this project, explaining, you know, there's, it's about time, you build a cast of a person and then you project it from there. And it's a sort of complicated thing just to explain on the phone and I expected this person to just go, oh, thank you so much for telling me about your interesting 
fascinating project, click, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but no, instead she said, oh, tell me more. I was like, okay. So, so I ended up collaborating with um, uh, Mohammed El Gurani, the youngest detainee at Guantanamo. And I got to know him and his story. And so this is also about stories, his story versus the US government story of what he, they said he was. Most of the people in Guantanamo are just, I mean, 95% very unlucky guys. Cab drivers, students, these are not the terrorist bad guys. I mean, there are a few of those guys. Um, and they uh, are uh, um, organizers of that. And, um, but mostly, you know, they were sold for $5,000 and, and somebody comes into their town and they go, you don't need to point, but just tell me if somewhere in this area is a, some guy from Saudi Arabia, because we're looking for Saudis. If you do, you don't have to point, but uh, you'll get $5,000. And it's, you know, so they all did that. And so Mohammed uh, El Gharani was uh, collaborating with, with us on this. And here he is. We built this st statue kind of the size of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, he, uh, we built a studio in Ghana where he was living because he uh, couldn't come. He, he, you know, you're, when you're in Guantanamo, you're stateless uh, when you're released. And it's very, very, very hard to get citizenship anywhere. The U.S. government makes it pretty hard for people. And he's not allowed to re-enter the no, United no, you, States, you, although no. he's now... No, he was he never was allowed to enter. Yeah. So I thought, let's have him enter digitally, you know, let's, and, and have him tell the story. So we really had uh, people listening to the story for, for the first time, and we, we, we had a m massive stacks of, of uh, legal, his legal story as well, what happened with, the, with, with all of that, and, and, and this completely fictitious thing that the, the US government had said, they said, they, they said oh, you were, this, this guy's from Chad, part of near Saudi Arabia, and was, he's go he was a goat herder. Um, but they said when he was eight, he was, uh, part of a terror spy in London, you know. So hard for a little eight-year-old goat herder to think of that, get to London, you know, start plotting. It was just, stories are absurd. You know, they're just, they're just taken out of the air for, for other reasons and placed it onto somebody. So that's what happened with Mohammed. And um, uh, so we... Um, he, he was in this big installation. He's also in uh, Washington, D.C. now, as a, not in a live situation, he's not streaming live, but it, it's just as a kind of uh, historical version of this piece. But uh, the thing that I, I think about the most when I, when I think of this project was, you know how uh, you always know where the cameras are? You know, so uh, in the like, parking lot or something, you know, oh, it's over there, or especially in London when they're like just everywhere. Uh, but um, uh, people who came to this could see that that you know there was a camera up there that was kind of looking at the statue so that it would give Mohammed a chance to move his hand to adjust his projected image onto the sculptural image of his body. So we would be talking to him, kind of going, Mohammed, just move your little finger like just an inch, and it would be like a foot. So and and so then gradually people realized that um, uh, if they stood in front of this statue and that he could see them, so there would be a feedback thing. So, and that was probably one of the, you know, most intense moments of my life as an artist because people could then make contact with this guy and they came with big signs saying, you know, Hello, Muhammad. They were waving. They brought their guitars. They 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 played for him, and he was like, "Whoa!" You know, because he he was somebody who had been called a terrorist by these people. You know, <laughs> and suddenly he's like right there, and and also telling some of his own stories about what, what happened because he wasn't just sitting silently. He spoke, and uh, and also uh, we had some other um, uh, installations of him. Uh, speaking, but anyway, they um, uh, were uh, 
also just mouthing things to him because there were no microphones. And so they would just uh, make the words, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it was like uh, um, the, this uh, moment where I, I, I just felt the, the, the um, uh, connection just clicked and, and I, it was a very, very uh, intense moment for me. Also, just in, in terms of, of stories too, like when you, when you see, you, know, like you just went for this really big fiction and here's a guy who's very, very articulate, very funny. And here's the weird thing about it too, is after being, he was 12, he was tortured, he was um, uh, caught up, he was, a lot of things happened to him that happened to a lot of people in Guantanamo and put in solitary, um, tortured. Uh, first by his, his uh, American interrogator, the first one was a woman who was like, think of me as your mother. And then she would send him to be tortured. You know, this kind of, this kind of thing. You know, just playing with, playing with people. And um, so, uh, anyway, it was, uh, there was also one guard there. Now these are, these guys are army guys. Now they they're ne didn't necessarily want to be prison guards. Mm -hmm. This was a job that nobody wants, you know, and suddenly they were guarding these people and they, who many of them liked, you know, and so this, this one soldier uh, taught Muhammad English by pasting a word a day under the door uh, to his cell and he could scrape it off and learn it and, um, and he, uh, at great risk to himself because he'd be court-martialed if he was like, like making friends with the terrorists so anyway that was um so then we have so so we did that in um uh as i, I showed you this uh, uh s smaller version in washington and we did this it's the same thing which was here's some more tiny people this is a, a thing of 18 little statues of people and you can walk into this room and they're 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 way down on the floor and they're all sharpening knives and you hear this um, it's a group called Citizens, and uh, anyway. Well, somebody described this tribute, because it's more than an exhibition, as an odyssey. Do you see your life as an odyssey, as a constant journey where the destination exists and doesn't exist at the same time? And since we will be working together also for the Kavafi Festival in Kavafi. April in the US, Ithaca just exists in order for you to make this long journey. So do you see your life and your artistic, I cannot actually distinguish your life and your artistic expression that much. So do you see your life as, a, as an odyssey? I think if, it, if an odyssey means that you don't know what you're looking for, definitely. Uh, so uh, I, you're open to temptations, I suppose. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, when I think of like 19th century science, I think of that as more of an odyssey, be, as as opposed to like 21st century science. Because in you know, scientists used to be able to do something like, I want to hold this petri dish up and let's see if either lightning's going to hit it or maybe some germs will start growing in it. We don't know what's going to happen. Now you have, if you're a scientist, you have to predict what the results are, of your experiment are going to be. You know, you have to like know what you're looking for before you start looking for it. So that doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> as, as in terms of uh, trying to make something like I'm trying to not make, but just see, you know, I, I don't know what I'm looking for. And uh, that was a thing that I learned when I was an artist in residence at NASA that I had a lot in, more in common with scientists than I thought because they don't know what they're looking for either, you know, mm -hmm. at least at NASA. They're not really it's sure. It's all about the process, so it's all about the journey. Yeah. And that's the best thing about accidents, that you find out things that if you were doing everything correctly, you wouldn't be finding it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess an accident is, it's a, it's a funny word, you know, because it, it's, it's a, something that's a, a miracle to someone is an accident to another, you know, it's like, a, I don't know. Is it like, uh, because you talk about death and freedom, 
So things that are death for some people are freedom for, for others, like guns and abortions. Yeah. So what's going on now with these two words well, in that's, your that world? Well, that was the, the, the whole, um, the, the whole um, uh, span uh, of uh, the, on one end of that spectrum is freedom and on the other is death. And that's why in two days, the, those two arguments which are uh, happening very, very intensely in the United States now, first of all, uh, there was the Supreme Court ruling that, yeah, guns, you, we, you know, let's, let's, let's lift a lot of those bans. And the second one was uh, abortions. Let's, let's try to like, control that. So um, the, those arguments that have death and freedom on either ends are, are, are guns and abortions. So because um, for some people, guns are freedom and others, guns are death. Uh, for some, abortion is freedom and others, abortion is death. So this is a very intense fight between not just you know laws, but between what you see as your freedom and what is death. So um, it's a it's a it's in a very elemental um, warfare that's going on in the United States now, and it's really fracturing the whole country. It's just really they're just wildly different. Um, things. Uh, on the one side, a group of people who really like to have things where lots of rules, really clear rules, and you know, we're just trying to make this, you know, and, and the other side, which is just going, um, uh, not so many. And they both claim that they're, uh, they're ruleless, mm. you know, and they're, they're more about freedom. So the word freedom is, nobody knows what it means now, mm. at all. There's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a free-for-all. It's a, but is freedom a state where there is no fear? I think there's always fear. I mean, fear is one of the most human things that we have. And uh, the, uh, this show in, in um, the Hirshhorn starts with these, these red flags, which is meant to be, um, well, it's, it's oh, whoops, that's a, a warning kind of situation, and also one that, that plays around with different ideas of patriotism and flag waving and, you know, what what, what um, side you're on and that this kind of thing. But do you have any fears that actually motivate you to do things? Are there any motivating fears in your life? Oh, well, sure. I mean, fear, fear of failure is probably a motivator, you know, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, a whole lexicon of fears, you know, uh, but I, I would say that I, I uh, am more inspired by, uh, uh, or I like to think that I'm more inspired by curiosity than fear. I, I, that may be so untrue, I don't know. I don't know myself that well. What's your biggest talent, your curiosity? That what? Your biggest talent. My biggest talent? Talent. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm not so good at, 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 the, at the big and small things, you know, like number one, number two. Um, uh, uh, I, I try to be curious, yeah, I do. I do try to, to not take things for granted, just look at them slightly askew and uh, without. Um, and, and I like to try to use these little tricks um, to, to be able to do that. And one that a friend of mine told me, which I, maybe you, you'll like this one, is, um, wait, do you, have, uh, do you have the same A and the Greek articles for things? No, according to the gender, it changes. So you don't have A, a or the? We do. Okay, so but yeah. we're gonna get it. Don't worry. If you just tell the story, we're gonna understand the. Okay, good. So, in English, uh, A is uh, more uh, general. Yes, uh, we we have that. A a lake, a tree, uh, and then there's the tree, the lake, and so if you're uh, driving, uh, she said, well, just change the article instead of I'm driving down the road, change it to I'm driving down a road. And it changes everything because it's not the road to your to the house or the road to mm -hmm. your job or something. It's a road, and you suddenly find yourself like looking around at um, in a different way at things. Like, oh, that 
look, look at the way the light is coming through that grove, or, or you know, or, uh, so it, it, it helps uh, do, um, uh, you see things um, a little bit fresher, I guess. Yeah, it's like E.E. E. Cummings, somewhere I have never traveled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can just, um, well, you know what they say, that you can never cross the same river. So I guess that change is always there, and even if you do drive the same road every single day, it's never the same because you are not. Yeah. And it, it's either later or earlier, so, mm. <laughs> yeah, always. You can see that for sure. I'm glad we got who, that clear. Who are up. the people that you go to? Who are the people that you ask things when you want an answer? Do you call your friends? Do you... Because for you, you, you look like a person who have all these answers. So for people who have this look of, I have the answers, I know things, it becomes a luxury to be able to ask. So when you want to ask, who are the people you turn to? Oh, it's, um, I have a lot of, a lot of people, and some of them are, are not uh, alive. So, um, and this is another exercise that I find really helpful. Uh, it's a kind of Tibetan thing again with Mingyur Rinpoche who just said, um, you try to imagine a tree, a, it's called a jewel tree, it's a huge tree, and on this tree you put everybody that you really admire. They can be, you know, your Uncle Al, your, they can, it can be Gandhi, it can be Dylan, it can be the Buddha, it can be any, Aristotle, all of those people, put them up there. And, um, and they are, uh, and, and recognize that they are there exclusively for you, to help you. They're here to help you. And they, and you, and you look at this tree and you uh, understand that it's all available to you. And so, uh, the, um, the, I have a lot of um, heroes also. So, I, <clears throat> Uh, people that I, I really uh, like, and so I would ask myself what they would might do in a situation. If I'm in a bad situation, I just think what would what would they do, and I and I try to um, get some courage from that. It's it's one of the reasons that I like biographies that have really dark parts in them, parts where not the hero the hero is just having a really rough time, and it's just like everything's falling apart, and. Because it's easy to be a nice person and interesting when everything's going your way. It's not so easy when things are falling apart and you're like, ah, oh, oh, you know, you just, it's really hard. And so uh, when, even when I was in high school, I used to have this list of, I called them great people. Now these great people were in my high school. They're just a little ahead and I, and I would watch them for for that during that time, you know, when they were not when they were like winning their trophies or winning the debate in cool, but when they when they lost a debate, and that's when I would go and and watch what they did with that. So um, I I mean I think it's also loss is a really amazing thing which you can uh, learn so much from, and 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 when things fall apart. So I think it's a, it's a, a really useful time to uh, see who you are and what you, what you want, you know. And so, um, not that I look forward to things falling apart, but I try, when they, when they do, I try to think, this is, this is amazing, you know. I, why was I so, why am I so afraid of this, you know. And it, it um, helps me to realize that it's, um, that it's the best time to make something, the best time, you know. And uh, it was the, this, I like to quote Willie Nelson on this because he was like, he was just saying, you know, um, about regret, you know, if you didn't have regrets, there would be hardly any music, you know. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, it's a um, uh, really, um, anyway, a great time to try to, to work. When, when things are just so bad. Do you think that you have experienced already the biggest loss in your life? 
Oh, well, yes, because I, 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 I don't know the rest of my life. I can't compare it to the bigger losses that are to come. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so far I have the biggest and the smallest, and medium as well. And, um, and I do find that uh, it, it's a really um, uh, uh, good time to, to do things. To reflect. To reflect and to, and to act, and to act, to, to take action, you know, because you can also, you don't have to just sit there while everything's falling on top of you. You can also, uh, you don't have to be passive when you're reflecting, you can. Well, you, you said it once that you felt like losing your country when the US invaded Iraq. But when you lose a person that you love, what kind of action can you take? Oh, there's a lot of things because I think uh, one of the things that uh, I find happens uh, when I've experienced death of people that I, I love is that uh, that it is a, a kind of release of love. It's not a uh, the end of it. It's just like there's an enormous whoa, uh, torrent of it, and maybe that's what happens in. Uh, uh, in death, that that, it, that gets released. I don't know, but I, I have seen it and experienced it. So it's quite um, uh, an extremely energetic situation of like an explosion. So um, uh, I think, uh, but there, there, I, I think many people have uh, so many different uh, experiences with that. Well, because we had this discussion, uh, like backstage. Could you just tell us the story regarding how can you dig it came to life as an expression? Oh, can you oh, just oh. tell our audience? Oh yeah. Because yeah. I think that this is an action that you can take having experienced the loss of a person you may love. Can you dig it? Oh, okay. Well, it, it's, it's a, we were talking about um, where language comes from and where words come from. And I was just saying that there's a beautiful book called Deep Blues by a writer named Robert Palmer, and he writes about beats. And he's writing about how beats started in different parts of Africa. And as, they, as these people were enslaved and taken to the New World, uh, they, were, uh, they were often taken to similar places so that, that people from Ghana went to Louisiana, people from uh, Nigeria, area, Nigerian area, which not Nigeria then, but uh, we're taking to West Virginia and, you know, so on. And that those uh, rhythms of those, uh, of the music of those of people uh, tended to um, uh, uh, stay somewhat um, intact. And then his story was the story of jazz and he, he talks about how those beats were changed in the in the south and the southeast of the United States and drifted up the Mississippi River to Chicago and became jazz and that's his story of beats but along the way he told the story of New Orleans of uh, some New Orleans guys who are jazz musicians who would always play for funerals because funerals in New Orleans are hugely ornate things and they they go on forever and they're you know it's really beautiful music really fantastic music and so these guys would be playing and the, the black bands and they'd come to this the cemetery and because they were also the workers they were also uh, uh, the ones who would dig the graves so that was the origin of uh, the phrase can you dig it so uh, can you can you dig a grave and can you can you dig a beat? Can you do this beat? So, uh, in a way, I, it's it makes sense to me just because uh, grief and work and um, and music are very, there's a lot of interplay in, in those things. Well, I'm gonna keep that sentence of yours that connects everything <laughs> in life and. Um, would we pass the mic to our audience to come up with questions? For oh, that would be fun. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Excellent. Hello. Perfect. <laughs> so, it's a great pleasure having you here. It's a, such an interesting discussion. Uh, in some of these questions, apart from the others who were more concentrated in the political part of your work and also in uh, parts of your artistic life, 
You mentioned quite a lot about your meditation experience. How much you think this experience, this experience of how can we say the experience of clear light affected to your work as a spiritual being, as, as a person also in the same time? Oh, well, um, I, I don't make a distinction between uh, that so much. Like, uh, e even though I'm a, a student of Buddhism, I, uh, I see it as the same, being a Buddhist and being an artist is the same, because uh, it's about uh, asking exactly the same questions. What is it? What is this? And uh, so I, and also I love the fact that there is absolutely no dogma. And it, for an artist, this is like just crack to find something that's like there's no buddy in charge. There's nobody in charge, and there are no rules. It's all up to you. you're in charge. It's terrifying, you know. So it, it, it is. A, it's a it's a really uh, uh, wonderful way to try to explore the world and trust yourself to, to do that and not to just kind of absorb other people's rules. So to really uh, try to find, find uh, what it is y yourself. So, um, and it's about, um, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's I suppose, uh, the, the reason I, I, I did this in the beginning was because I, I was having trouble concentrating. And a friend said, um, oh, I did this, uh, um, retreat, 10 day retreat, silent retreat, and um, uh, I was very scattered, and at the end of this thing, my mind was like a beam, and I could just shift it over here, shift it over there, shift it over there, and the chatter had stopped. I was like, whoa, I want a mind like a beam. So I went to this place and uh, in Western Massachusetts, where I still go, and it's a um, Vipassana a type of Buddhism. And they said, well, uh, welcome to the uh, retreat, and uh, you, I guess you're here because you're in pain. I said, no, I'm not in pain. I'm here to get a mind like a beam. And they said, no, you're in pain. I said, no, beam. And they said, pain, beam. It was a really ridiculous conversation. And so gradually I realized that it was, that was why they were right. Um, because Vipassana is based on, uh, 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 well, pain storage, really. So that it, when something happens and you don't just, ah! You know, you don't scream, you put it somewhere. And so in psychoanalysis, you look through for those things through language, through stories of like blah, blah, blah. And, and, and um, in, in this exer uh, exercise, let's say, uh, you uh, find it through your body. And uh, I trust my body more than I do my storytelling abilities, you know, uh, because I can just be too... Um, uh, get carried away with words, and your body, your body doesn't lie, you know. The, it, your body has a mind of its own, let's say, and it will retain things. So that, for example, in this case, you know, uh, they feel that every time you have anger, it goes. I mean, it seems to go right to your liver. If you if you meditate for 18 hours a day, like we did, you are in pain most of the time, you know, and and you actually realize that. It is associated with emotion, so that you have, literally, if you're, you literally have a heartache and you, it, your heart hurts, and that, and you, and you experience all those emotions, or anger is in your liver, or, or rage in your jaw. You can feel your jaw locking up, you know, just, and it's, and it's doing that. You're like, whoa, that is, you're a library of pain, you know. You just, and you look around in your body, and you find it, and it's really. Uh, it's really uh, very, very, very clear. It's not theoretical at all. So this is what I like about it, is that you, you get this super clear message of, of what um, you're experiencing and, and you, you aren't labeling it some other thing, you know. It, it's, it is, it's right there and, it's, and it tells you all that stuff. So this is um, uh, why I, uh, and, and then, Further, in the nature of mind study, it, it really is um, about, I mean, I'm sure many of you have done these kinds of things of, you know, your thoughts are clouds and this and that. And uh, I have a, um, a Swiss teacher who is uh, also a really wonderful um, teacher. And 
many Buddhists say, you're, imagine your mind is a clear sky, you know, and the, the clouds are the thoughts, thoughts, and you just let them go by. Listen, they don't bother you, let them go by. It's like you're a mother at a park and you're watching your kids play. You don't have to play their games, but you're watching them, you know, just you know, let them do what they do. Um, but he, because he's Swiss, he said, imagine that your mind is a, is a little lake. And you're like, oh, you're so Swiss. And little, your thoughts are little boats. And here they come, here, go, here comes another one. Let that one go, see this, the other one goes. And what I liked especially about this guy was he said, now, try to picture the wind that's blowing those boats. What kind of wind is blowing that boat? Is it a fierce, like, like winter wind? Or is it a soft breeze? Or where do your thoughts come from? How, what's the engine down there that is, that is, that is driving you? So this is what, what I find fascinating about this is, is like, it's all nice, it's nice to have interesting thoughts and so on, and it's like the art world is full of interesting thoughts. Um, what's the engine, you know? And, and you as a person, what is your engine of, of your, where, where are they coming from? So I find that, that really, really helpful uh, in, in, uh, my life to to think of 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 how that works. Oh. I'd like to ask you if, of course, you wish to share a memory from some people that uh, you have crossed uh, paths with. Well, in one case, more than crossed, and uh, these people are. William S. Barrows, Brian Eno, and of course, Lou Reed. Well, here's, um, here's Bill. Picture, exactly. <laughs> and I uh, just happened to have that. And, and John Giorno, who is a really wonderful um, uh, poet, he did a thing called Dial a Poem. And so you'd, you'd like you know, you'd punch in some phone numbers on an on a old dial phone and hear a poem. Um, uh, and Burroughs, who was like, as I mentioned before, this is a person who taught me the word you, because he, would, he wasn't talking about I da da da, it was, it was always about you. And now this guy, okay, he was, he was a terrifying guy. You know, he came, came out of the 50s and uh, into like, uh, a really polite America where all the like grass was just perfect and all the little little lawns, everyone had nice lives and everyone was barbecuing and here comes Uncle Bill and he's it's Uncle Bill and we're like everyone's hide it's Uncle Bill you know he's here and and he just talked talked about um, uh, his uh, his work was hilarious, really dark, really really funny and um, and. Just oh god! I mean, it's like, anyway, we we did some touring together. He also did not like he Bill liked guns and he didn't like women. Speaking of guns and women, um, we got along I think because we met at something called the Nova Convention, and that was like um, I was using a filter that lowered my voice like that, and I was wearing a tuxedo, and I was sitting in the backstage on a on a desk, and Bill's. Uh, it was like, a, so uh, you, you're on next, right? And I was like, yeah. And, and I suddenly realized, oh, he thinks I'm a boy. <laughs> he thinks I'm a boy. So <laughs> it was that, that was how we met. And, I, um, uh, and he's hitting on me. So I was like, wow, this is weird. You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, we became friends and we did this tour together. Um, he was always, he'd always be out in the parking lot uh, head of the the show uh, doing target practice. Um, not everyone's perfect. Anyway, but uh, the, I uh, wrote a song from called The Languages Virus from Outer Space. And I've been thinking about that what, what, as COVID is like passing around because um, it is a strange thing for a writer to say, you know, that language is a, is a disease, communicable by mouth. Uh, so now that everyone's having masks on, um, you realize virus, one of the reasons it is hanging on so long is that virus is also a language. And it's, it's not alive. 
It, it has much in common with language. It's, it's, um, it's uh, highly contagious. It's replicable. You know, it, it's, it, uh, it be can become go viral. It is um, uh, so, uh, and it, it, it's very hard to um, parse. So, uh, because it, it keeps changing, it's always morphing. Anyway, um, uh, so um, Bill was um, uh, he, he was he was very deceptive. He was he was one of these cranky guys who's super crusty and and uh, uh, very very uh, sweet um, a person actually and. Um, the um, uh, he also asked about Brian Eno and also Lou, and so I'll tell you one thing about Brian Eno uh, was that um, uh, he he uh, he's a super positive person, you know, and and he's also one of my heroes. So I I think of of he him. He has been on this stage in discussion, so oh, he yeah. has left his mark here as well. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's um. Uh, uh, a very, very um, positive person, but also is always um, looking at uh, things really from another um, angle. And I, w I was thinking of, of what he was saying about, he, lo he loves like fading things out. He loves like really long fades in music, really, really long, painfully long fades. And, you know, I was like, why do you, what are you just, what are you doing? Like, what, what did, how do things end? You know, do they just like go off into the distance until you just can't see them anymore? And he just said, well, it, he likes that because it's like you're walking away from the music, you know, it's ha still happening over there and you're just moving away and it's all, it's still always happening. So don't worry, it's not actually ending. I think he had a, like a worry that it would end. So he didn't want it to end. So it was just you, you walk away and distance takes you, makes it seem quieter. So it wasn't like, but I, I remember being in the studio with him many times with, with this just, you know, interminable fade down to the next <laughs> one. Oh, just fall asleep, but we also he had a very meditative way of thinking of music because my studio used to have a big uh, window on the on the Hudson River, and we would always look at the river as a, as the way to decide whether the music was any good. So we would play the last mix, and we would look at the river, and it didn't matter if it was really fast or slow, or you know, it wasn't it wasn't about mood. It was really about like somehow this. This resonance, I would have to say, resonance that, that it had with the river, the, with the natural uh, motion of the rhythm, rhythm, even if it was like choppy and like rhythmic, it, it, it's not that it was like arrhythmic, it was, or if it was like, uh, so in other words, it, it, if it goes with the river, it goes on the record was our, was our motto. And it, it was infallible because it was just something that would be uh, not forced, not forced, uh, but not, uh, but but contained and had a certain kind of coherent motion, and was was not like you know pushed so hard. It had had its own integrity, its own energy to to do. Um, and uh, we also asked about Lou, my husband of 21 years, and um, uh, well, you know, we were together 21 years, but uh, so. Uh, uh, let's see, what can I say about, you know, there's almost nothing you can say about your best friend <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, except that, you know, um, it really irritated me that he could just write a song in his mind and then just, he, it would be done. So that's the only thing I'll say about <laughs> other than the fact that I loved him more than anyone else. But, um, yeah, he would just see a whole song and they would just write it down and, and a lot of other people, myself included, are always tinkering with things, you know, like, I have to change this, and he was going, nope, that's done, it's, it's perfect. I was like, how, what is this kind of confidence? <laughs> I was always in awe of the confidence. Um, so I, I, uh, I try to uh, think of, of uh, his confidence when I, when I lose my confidence. And, and just realize, you know, it's not about how you appear to other people. 
It is really just how you have your feet on the ground and that, that you can um, uh, uh, be your own uh, uh, anchor, let's say, your own anchor. It's also um, uh, Tai Chi, as much as music uh, f for, for him was a way to be in the world uh, in, a, in a way that was very centered and, and not really looking around for other people to say yes or no. It was not doing that. So this is, this is a very, very crucial thing to think about, like, like um, who are you? And, and how is it, what does it mean to be actually true to yourself? True to yourself. And um, uh, I guess that was invented here, know thyself, you know, was probably the, the, the biggest key thing that, you know, I, I, I think of when I, when I think of, of Lou is, is that he was able to, to, to do, I mean, nobody is, is completely perfect in that, but, but ha really had that as his um, center. So, uh, and I, I find that that's uh, a really useful thing to, to think about, um, to find your own center. And it has nothing to do, it certainly has something to do with other people, but, but um, it's all up to you. May I ask for a favor? Since time is up, as it says. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> get off the stage. <laughs> when, when somebody asks you uh, like, be, about being yourself and who you are, we tend to answer by saying our name. So may I just ask you to say, I am Laurie Anderson. Uh, hi, I'm Laurie Anderson. And may I ask the audience to say the name Laurie Anderson, like using the most Greek accent you can come up with, <laughs> like one, two, three. Laurie this is who you are in Greek. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your interpretation. Thank you. <laughs>